All business grade Cisco routers can use OSPF, but it's not turned on by default. To turn OSPF on, we need to enable the OSPF process. Let me show you how that's done on a router. The command we use is router OSPF, followed by a process number. As soon as we enter this command, OSPF is running. We use the router command for all dynamic routing protocols. You could use it with EIGRP or BGP to start those processes. 10 is the process ID that we've chosen. This can be any number from 1 to 65,535. At the CCNA level, it doesn't matter what number you choose. The reason we have a process number is to support advanced configurations. In some cases, we need to run more than one OSPF process. But one process is plenty for us, so we'll stick with that. You probably don't know this yet, but there are two versions of OSPF we can use. Version 2 and version 3. Version 2 is still the most common, but it only supports IPv4. If you want to use IPv6, which we'll do much later in a different video, you need OSPF v3. If we want to stop the OSPF process, we have two options. One is to remove the OSPF configuration. The other is to enter the shutdown command. This is more gentle as it keeps all our configuration in place and allows us to turn it on again with no shutdown. As a dynamic routing protocol, OSPF discovers other routers that also run OSPF. The only catch is they all have to be adjacent. This means they need to connect to each other directly from a layer 3 perspective. In the topology here, R1 connects to R2. These routers are adjacent, so they can become neighbors of each other. It's the same as R2 and R3. R1 and R3 are not adjacent, as they are not connected to each other. R1 and R3 do not become neighbors. They don't immediately become neighbors though. We need to add some more configuration first. We're going to add the command network 172.16.0.0 and then 0.0.0.3 area 0. Right away we get a message which means that R1 and R2 are now neighbours. This means that R2 has already been configured with the same commands. So let's break this command down. Every routing protocol uses the network command. It tells the routing protocol which interfaces we're willing to see neighbors on. If you want to check out the lab later, we'll see an alternative to this network command. 172.16.0.0 is the network address of the interface on our router. That part's easy. Now, 0003. That's a new one. This is called a wildcard mask. It's a bit like a reverse subnet mask. I'll get back to explaining how that works soon. Area 0 is something specific to OSPF. OSPF likes to arrange routers and links into areas. All OSPF topologies must have at least one area, which must be area 0. In short though, what this command is saying is, I want to look for other OSPF neighbors on this interface. So it's clear that I'm going to need to explain a few more things. Let's start with areas. OSPF is very good at organizing the network. It uses areas to group links and routers. This makes it possible to tune how OSPF works according to your needs. The good news for you is that the CCNA exam doesn't test you on multiple areas, so you don't need to worry about this in much detail right now. What you do need to know is that all OSPF topologies must have at least one area. This is area zero, and this is called the backbone of the network. If we do have other areas, they must connect to area zero somehow. But it is quite acceptable to have only one area, area zero, in the entire network. Other areas are entirely optional. The command we used earlier meets these requirements by using area zero. The next interesting thing is the wildcard mask. So what is it? It's like a subnet mask in many ways. It's a 32-bit number, which we can show in binary or decimal, and it goes along with an IP address. Also like a subnet mask, it shows parts of an IP address that we're interested in. When we look at it in binary, 
The zeros represent the parts of the addresses that we're interested in. The ones are the bits that we don't care about. When we use the mask to compare the network address and the IP address, we can see that we only care about the first 30 bits only, and we don't care at all about the last two bits. The router knows that we want OSPF to use any interface with an IP that matches the bits that we care about. And in this case, they do match. Now that seems complicated, right? Well, for a simple example like this, well, it really is. But wildcard masks let us do all sorts of fancy matching if we want to. You don't need to get too complicated for the CCNA exam though. If you want to see a fancier example, check out the lab at the end of the video. We'll use one wildcard mask and network command to match a few interfaces at once. Time now to go back to OSPF neighbors. By entering the network command, we told the router to enable OSPF on any interface that matches the network and wildcard mask and put them into area zero. There was one interface that matched this criteria on router R1. This caused two things to happen. The router started sending hello messages, often using multicast, on interface gig 0 slash 0. It also starts processing any hello messages that it receives rather than ignoring them. These hello messages enable the two routers to find each other and become neighbors. The second thing the network command does is to advertise this interface's network. This enables other OSPF routers to learn about this network and how to get there. To verify that this has indeed happened, there are a few commands we can use. First, let's try show IP OSPF, which gives us general OSPF settings. We can see things like the process number, as well as the router's ID, and the areas that the router is in. We'll come back to the router's ID soon. We can use show IP OSPF interface to list all the OSPF enable interfaces and whether they're up. This also shows us the process ID that the interface is part of. And finally, show IP OSPF neighbor. Remember to use the American spelling, which is something I often forget to do. This shows our OSPF neighbors, the interfaces they're on, their address, and their ID. This is the command I use most with OSPF. Let's come back to the router ID. Each router needs a unique way to identify itself to other routers. That's what the router ID does. So each OSPF router has a router ID and the router ID has to be unique. You'll also notice that it looks like an IP address. It's only a 32-bit number, but it's formatted like an IP to make things easier. There are three ways a router ID could be set. The first is if we set it ourselves. We'll see that soon. If we haven't set it, the router will select the highest IP address on our loopback interface. By highest, I mean the largest number. If we haven't set it and there's no loopback, then the router selects the highest IP of any active interface. To see the router ID, we use the command show IP OSPF. The ID is here on the first line. In this case, the router chose the ID based on the highest IP of an active interface. To set this, we'll first configure the OSPF process. Remember to use the right process ID. If we use a different number here, we'll start a new and unique OSPF process. Now we can use the router ID command to set the ID to whatever we want. It needs to be something that makes sense to us and is in IP address format. As shown in this message, this change doesn't apply right away. We need to start the OSPF process first, and to do that, we use the clear IP OSPF process command. Be careful when you run this command. This causes the neighbors to drop and their adjacencies to form. This is fine in the lab, but on a real network, this is disruptive. If we look at the router ID again, we can confirm it has changed. There's one last thing I want to say about forming adjacencies. Routers use hello messages to share information about themselves. There are a few details in these messages that must match before neighbors will form. These include being in the same area, having the same authentication details or no authentication, 
the connected interfaces must match, meaning the same network and subnet mask. Timers, that is, how often hello messages are sent, as well as the dead interval. We'll cover that a bit later on. The MTU of the connected interfaces. This one has caught me out a few times in the real world. I've got a couple of questions here that you might find a bit tricky. With a bit of thought though, I'm sure you can do it. 